Get on Team Shaq with WinBet. We're playing parlays, boosting odds, and laying the wildest prop bets. Don't miss another game. Download the WinBet sport betting app today. Sign up today and win $200 in free bets when you place a $50 first-time wager on a straight bet or parlay. Offer subject to change, terms and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in a state where play-through WinBet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. Blue Wire. First pick in the 1991 NBA draft, the Charlotte Hornets select Larry Johnson from University I'm not supposed of to be here, man. A lot of people from where I'm from, so don't, don't make it. Charlotte, we're back. Thanks for joining us again for another Buzz Beat. This is Richie, and I'll be joined by Spencer and Brian on this Saturday morning. We get to react to some pretty important news as Charlotte has finally hired a new head coach. Before we dive into this, I wanted to let y'all know about Buzz Beat Plus. It's a private podcast feed that our listeners can take advantage of for $35 a month through Substack. I will put the link in the episode notes. But with that, you get three perks. Number one, ad-free episodes. Number two, early access to episodes. I actually did an interview with Jalen McDaniel's trainer, which is out right now on BuzzBeat Plus, but won't be available until Tuesday on the public feed. And then number three, exclusive episodes as well. Sometimes we'll put out episodes that just never make it to the public feed. So check that out. It's a good way to support us, but I also think it's stuff that is worthwhile to pay for if you're a consistent podcast listener of ours. So yesterday we got the news that Kenny Atkinson was hired on a four-year deal to become the Hornets new head coach, replacing James Borrego. Wanted to give a quick rundown of some background information on Kenny Atkinson. He is uh, 55 years old, just turned 55 years old recently, currently coaching with the Golden State Warriors in the NBA finals. He was an assistant with Ty Lue the season prior And then what he's mostly known for, he spent three years plus, actually closer to four years, with Brooklyn. And that's where he made his name for himself after inheriting a team that wasn't that great. I mean, he was able to get the most out of his players like Levert and D'Angelo Russell and Joe Harris. And then he was fired in March of 2020 when the season that season when Durant and Kyrie and, and DeAndre Jordan joined. So before I throw it to you, Spencer, my initial reaction to this hiring is this. I think after Ham went to LA, he was my favorite, even just by, you know, even just by little, my favorite candidate remaining. I think the comparison to Borrego, while somewhat valid because of that player development title, doesn't fully paint the picture. I think he can create a culture here and he's worked under some really good coaches like Ty Lu and Budenholzer and Steve Kerr. And funny enough, he's actually worked under Mike D'Antoni in New York. Uh, But he's also, you know, obviously been on some playoff teams as well. I think that goes a long way. So I think the hope here would not only that Atkinson is bringing that player development side, but he also incorporates a lot of what he has learned from these coaches that he's worked with. And many of these coaches have produced good defenses, which is something that Charlotte desperately needs. But Spencer, what was your gut reaction to this hiring? Well, I mean, First and foremost, I mean, I think Kenny Atkins is a really good coach. <laughs> I mean, I think he proved that in Brooklyn. Um, you know, the the player development with guys like Dan Woody, uh, maybe his his most successful development. I mean, it's there. Like you can you can tell, you can see that he's a really good coach and he's well respected across the league. I just like generally think that <clears throat> because you brought up one thing, Richie, you said you know he can build a culture here, um, which I think he can. Like I'm cautiously optimistic that works. I'm just of the thought that like, that's what James Brego was doing. And uh, right. he had a lot of success with player development and skill development with those guys uh, as young players. And, you know, outside of the consistent defensive struggles, it's, it's kind of hard to poke holes in what Brego was able to do in my opinion in Charlotte. So the comparison is just like these guys strengths seem to be <clears throat> somewhat aligned and so to extend the coach before that i mean it, this is mj's money like he can do whatever he wants with his money right but like i just generally think it's bad business and we've seen this a lot like to pay a guy 
to go away who you just extended six months ago and now you're going to bring in a guy and the the talk is player development and 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 culture and these same talking points we heard with Borrego. So, you know, very clearly <clears throat> this whole we needed a new voice outside of just that. I'm not exactly sure what that means. <laughs> like what, what what is the need for a new voice? It's just the young players on this team just tune Borrego out. That's what and I'm so thinking. Now bring, yeah. yeah, right. So now bring in a guy like Atkinson who – Correct me if I'm wrong, kind of got chased out of Brooklyn for the same reasons. You know, he got the superstar treatment, similar, right? When similar, Kyrie, yeah. So, like, I, I, there's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot about James Borrego and Kenny Atkinson that I'm sure I don't understand. But from a 50,000-foot scope of this, I, I'm not sure I totally understand it. But, again, I think Kenny Atkinson's a good coach and has a chance to be successful here. Uh, I just thought that, like, that's kind of the direction we were headed in with Borrego. But, again, there's a lot that that I don't know. I think it's, like, a, a solid hire. Just, just overall, I'm curious to see what this signals for Charlotte defensively. Um, it's kind of one of the directions I'd, I'd actually like to take it in. <clears throat> you know, Kenny Atkinson inherited – a mess uh, in Brooklyn when he arrives there in 2016 and it's going to be a long rebuild and it was long, but they started seeing success. What year three under Kenny Atkinson. And even then along the way, there are sort of like more modest improvements, right? So year one, these are according to cleaning the glass year one under Kenny Atkinson in Brooklyn uh, 23rd in defensive efficiency, year two, 22, year three, number 15, uh, year four, like borderline top 10, number 13 in the NBA in defensive efficiency. And a lot of that was done with Brooklyn trying to play, what, drop, pick, and roll coverage. Yep. And so I'll be fascinated to see how that informs Charlotte's off season, because as we know right now, there really isn't the personnel in a variety of different ways to actually or successfully orchestrate drop pick and roll defense. So at the top of the list, can you coax better point of attack defense from LaMelo? We've seen flashes of it. We've seen some screen navigation. We know he has the length. We definitely don't get that on a night to night possession by possession basis. So can Kenny Atkinson coax some of that out of LaMelo? And then can we get some more of that out of Terry Rozier? What does that mean for James Booknight? Um, what does that mean for how they want to address things in the offseason with, um, you know, with someone like, uh, like uh, McDaniels or, or Cody Martin, um, all of which will be kind of interesting to see. And then, yes, what do they do with the center position? Uh, do you use the 13th or the 15th pick on someone like Mark Williams yeah. uh, and try to have turn that guy into, you know, your Jared Allen type project, the guy that's, you're going to be your, your young drop center. And you're going to build your defense around this guy. Or do you use your, you know, do you try to do something in free agency? There's a way for Charlotte to crack what the full mid-level exception, depending on some of the things they do this off season so, you know, is that a way to explore the center market? Is a trade a way to explore the center market? Um, but anyways, it, it makes it would make sense, I think, for Charlotte to try to find some, you know, one or two guys that are going to try to be the drop center defensively for this team in pick and roll. So that that is something that I'll, that I'll be interested to see. Or is Atkinson a little more flexible and just given the way the personnel is set up on the roster and depending on what levers they're able to pull this offseason – you know, they're going to have to be more, uh, you know, versatile in terms of their pick and roll coverages and scheme next season. So I think that is, is actually like kind of, I don't know where I'm like starting with Atkinson is sort of like, what's this base defense going to look like? Because that's been the, this team has been a mess defensively the last couple of seasons. I often leaned on that being um, due to, uh, personnel and just the sort of like how the, the, the pieces and parts didn't really fit. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of things you couldn't do in terms of scheme. And so I think obviously the roster needs some retooling in that regard. Um, that also may inform Richie to your point that you brought up when we started this podcast, like sort of uh, a, like the develop the player development aspect of someone like Kenny Atkinson 
but also like how does that inform what the team's arc is? Like what's the what's the growth pattern? Do does the Charlotte want to be try to become a 51 team next year? Are they looking at this as a way to sort of like I don't know, because they have two first round picks, you're bringing in a guy like Atkinson that helped um get Brooklyn from the bottom to being a pretty good team. Are they looking at this with sort of like a longer time frame, right? Are they saying, okay, yeah, we want to see some incremental growth in year one, but really like we're hoping to make like a big, big step in year two or three. Um, and so is this sort of, is, is this informing perhaps like a somewhat of a, like a, I don't know, like a quick reset on the rebuild. I, I don't, I doubt it. I mean, I think that would be interesting if that's the case. It just doesn't seem like that's something the organization would do, especially with some of the contracts that are currently on the roster that can change, but the, that I will be kind of fascinated to see like sort of like what the expectations are and sort of, yeah, what the development and pathway is for Atkinson and Charlotte. You're finally at that hot new spot. The one your friends keep raving about. Sitting across from your date, it's going... Another round? Really well. And that dish you've been dying to try, oh, it's headed your way. You can smell it, hear it sizzling fresh off that skillet as it comes closer, closer, and served. Go ahead, enjoy. After your phone sneaks a bite first. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Yeah, I had that in my notes, too, as well, in terms of the defensive fit. I think this is where we might see the most noticeable change. And to your point, we've always said this on the podcast, it always depends on personnel. So certain schemes you just can't play because or you can't play effectively because you don't have the right personnel. But Kenny's very analytical and he's a disciple of Coach Bud. And I I bet we see more drop coverage this year. And I tweeted something out late last night, or I guess probably early this morning around midnight, that Mark Williams would just make a ton of sense uh, when trying to fit into a potential drop scheme. And if that's the route that Atkinson wants to go. So I I think Atkinson uh, sees the value in drop coverage, forcing opponents to hit pull-up shots, forcing opponents to hit floaters, and he'll live with it. I think the Hornets did not do a great job, obviously, protecting the rim under Borrego's tenure. And I think that has to be a big point of emphasis for Kenny. And with one thing, uh, you know, getting Mark Williams or getting a center in here that can play drop coverage, you can take away attempts at the rim and just live with opponents, you know, on pull up mid range shots or pull up three point shots. So that's the one thing that I I noted as well, Brian, that defensive fit and how much change we're going to see for this upcoming year. Yeah. And like, I just, just a quick note, like if Williams who, who worked out on Friday in Charlotte too, Mm -hmm and met with the media afterwards too. Like obviously a lot of people are obviously drawing a circle around Williams and, and Charlotte. Like it, it makes sense in a lot of ways, but also in terms of just like, he's likely to be available at 13 or 15 uh, in, in the selection process. And I do think Williams has the ability that depending on matchup, Charlotte could try to bring him up a little bit higher. You know what I mean? He, he improved even in the course of his sophomore season being more versatile laterally. This is something that uh, my chef, we talked about often uh, after Duke games this past year um, was how Mark got more dynamic and more explosive laterally. So he's still improving there. And he's a guy that I don't think at this point you could really trust him coming like up and really trying to like stay in front of like, you know, a one or even like B plus, you know, like NBA creators, I think he, he can give you a little bit of that depending on the matchup and hopefully improve on it. But yeah, the main thing is like to play drop, you know, the center's just got to be massive, right? Like it has to be enormous. That's what, this is like how one of the reasons why Brooke Lopez has, has yeah. been such an excellent, you know, backline guy for, uh, for Milwaukee, for, for Milwaukee the last couple of seasons. This is why Jared Allen has, can be such a dominant drop center at times, just, you know, elite size at that, at that position in terms of length, it could possibly mean like a little less PJ Washington as a small ball five. If that's the case, Uh Um, we'll see, Uh, you know, you never know. Uh, But perhaps that is something, you know, that maybe we see a little less sort of like a pure positionless approach to defense. I think offensively, you know, PJ is certainly someone that 
Kenny's going to want to use this sort of a small ball five. So how do you sort of like thread the needle there? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. And then again, it's tough to project some of this stuff because we don't know, like we know what some of the roster is going to look like in a couple of months from now, but some of it is still like a bit of a, you know, a black box, right? Like we don't know who's going to exactly be here, you know, beyond once all the frenzied of moves um, happens league wide this off season. Yeah. I mean, just a few thoughts uh, to build on what you guys are talking about, you know, defensively. I I mean, I think you're nailing it. I think we're going to see more traditional drop coverage and that's exciting, you know, for like a group that we've watched <laughs> the last few seasons uh, starting from, you know, kind of building from the ground up, if you will, I think from a scheme perspective is a really good thing for Charlotte. And, you know, I do still think that like having PJ Washington and having that versatility, with what seems to be his best role is like a small ball five. I still think they can, you know, play a small switch everything type of scheme or switch a lot and just clean up some stuff and and clean up some stuff around the edges, right? Like just a little bit better communication, a little bit better understanding of how we're Xing out uh, and rotating out of these switches. And, you know, what we're, you know, that seemed to be the, a lot of the issue defensively for this group outside of what you mentioned, Brian, which is the pieces just really didn't fit uh, to play a traditional system, but they were, they were just consistently a a confounding, just a terrible communication team. Uh, And I think that that can be cleaned up. So my point is there is, yeah, you know, we can get more of a traditional defensive scheme coming with Atkinson, but you, you still have that flexibility built into the roster where you can go to a lot of different looks still. And I think you will, but just clean up the stuff around the edges and, and just become better communicators of better rotational defenders. Look, at, again, I think Atkinson's going to, he's going to improve this defense in year one, how much of that we see uh, immediately, how much they're able to rise up the ranks is going to depend, uh, you know, a lot on, on how long he's, he's around. I would like to know towards the back end of this contract, he was like year three, a team option. Is he your foot, you know, is your for the club option? There's got to be one in there somewhere, I would imagine. I haven't seen that anywhere. Richie, dude, that hasn't come no, out. Has all it? I've seen is four years. That's all I've seen. Yeah, yeah. same. So I, I would be interested, you know, to know what kind of flexibility Charlotte, you know, built into that contract. You know, to Brian's point, too, is like, is this a mini reset? Like, is, is this the guy that's going to take them to fourth or fifth in the East? Like, four years is not nothing, you know, it's, but but what kind of outs are built in there? I I think is interesting because of what we just learned with Borrego, right? Like Charlotte will make a change out of nowhere. (laughs) And so I I think that's important context. Yeah. I I do just real quickly. I do kind of wonder if like what he's done the last two seasons, being an assistant for these like very good win now teams, right? The Clippers last season, Steve Kerr and the Warriors this season who are, you know, two wins away from a title. A, those are two pretty creative systems to, to be in, right? Ty Lu is, is a phenomenal coach and is, you know, a clever mind and a clever creator of offensive time of after timeout calls. You know, James Borrego is pretty good at doing that as well. Borrego, but Ty Lu is someone that'll just throw, try anything, right? We'll try anything lineup wise. Uh, scheme wise zone whatever and then in a team like golden state that just plays like this sort of like unique style of basketball um that is totally fit for them and fit for the talents of, of steph curry specifically so you know i'll be curious to see how much of not only just like how much do we see some of those components perhaps come to charlotte in terms of the versatility the flexibility the try anything nature of 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 the tai lu coach um and then sort of like well do you see i feel like under in under kenny atkinson in brooklyn the nets were thought of as this sort of like spread pick and roll machine maury ball right everything's at the rim or it's a three at least until things shifted underneath uh the you know when Kyrie arrives in, in 2019 and maybe that changes but i guess my thought would be and what i was initially trying to get at was with Atkinson is the thought, you know, is the thought that he's because he spent the last two years with these teams that were contending for titles in various capacities. Does that sort of like, I don't know, does that change his profile as a coach at all? You know what I mean? Does it, this is the thought is that 
you know, is that for lack of a better term, some type of like rebrand, right. You know, to all of a sudden stop being like the development guy and the rebuild guy and becoming the, no, 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 no. Like you can copy and paste me for a ready-made win, win now team. And, and I'm here. So, um, I don't know. I could be reading too much into that. Maybe it doesn't matter one way or the other. Um, but, but I do think that's like possibly like an interesting note, uh, of Atkinson and of this hire. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, he's been there, right? Like he's been in the fire. Uh, he's been in these high leverage situations year over year, you know, the last few on these teams to Brian's point. So I, no, I, I think that that is, I think that's totally logical how you'd be looking at that and probably how Charlotte was and, you know, how, how when now ready, you know, this roster actually is, we can, we could debate that, but um, <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, but the point is, the point is taken. Right. And so when you have to build, you're going to build around a guy like LaMelo, like I'm sure Atkinson's voice has changed, you know, with the, with this, his development. Um, and, and so they're hoping that that can, that can translate to guys like LaMelo and Bridges. I did want to circle back to just like some center options. You know, we were talking about Mark Williams earlier. I think mean, it's obviously good for Charlotte that they can, they don't have to like pinpoint one guy to try to, fill this center role with like they can pick Williams at 13 or 15 and use part of the mid-level or the entire mid-level on say a Isaiah Hartenstein or so, something like that. Like yeah. they can, yeah. Yeah. they can do two different roads and figure out which one makes more sense. That would, that would be a good sign by the way, Spencer, but keep going. Yeah, I think so. I hadn't really thought about him. And then he, he came up on a podcast the other week I was listening to uh, as an option for Charlotte. And I, I admittedly had not seen enough of him, so I, I kind of dug in last week. He's a much better defender than I realized. Um, he can really pass, too. He can, yeah. You can do, like, yeah. five-out handoff stuff with him, too. No, he had a great season this year. He did, you know. So I, I think that he's a guy you look at for Charlotte or, uh, or you know, Nurkic, I still think, is, like, a possibility and, and kind of more your traditional drop center behemoth kind of guy that – you know, you, you probably start him and let a guy like Williams come along slowly. The other, like, pie in the sky, um, this is like the apex mountain idea for Charlotte, is finding a way to package that 13th and 15th pick and something, some other stuff, you know, in a sign and trade for DeAndre Ayton. I mean, I, I'm i sure that they're looking at that uh, as a possibility, and I think it's probably when you look at, like, top 10 starting caliber centers in the league it, it's the most realistic for charlotte in that kind of scenario just because like i think we all you know if we're nba fans we know how the suns operate we know how robert sarver operates you know if he can get cheaper <laughs> get a few draft picks and not have to pay his center a max contract i'm sure that's something that he would be interested in, in discussing so it, i mean it's the most important thing charlotte has to yeah. do this offseason there's a lot of different directions they can go so I think it's interesting too, like we're talking about the center position with PJ Washington. And I think when I was thinking about this hire with Atkinson, I was wondering which player currently or which players currently on the roster does it benefit the most? In some ways, I can see it benefiting PJ Washington, especially on the offensive side, you know, pushing the pace. That's something that Borrego did, but that's something that uh, Atkinson did as well with the Nets. You know, he was known for that. And I think we'll see a heavy dose of like pistol sets and five out delay sets and just staggered screens where. Where PJ's at the top of the the key as a, as a trail man, and he's going to be you know given the green light to shoot the ball a little bit more, work out as yeah. a, as a playmaker. I think the offense that Atkinson runs is kind of sharing the load a little bit more, and maybe that doesn't work with personalities like Kyrie and Durant, but I think it can work with this roster at least at least right now. So, but on the defensive end, like does he fit that role defensively with the drop scheme? Probably not as much. Probably not as much. So do you guys have a, have a clue as to like which player or players on this roster you feel like would benefit the most from a hire in Atkinson? Or is it just kind of too early to tell? I think, I mean, I think at the top of the list, well, first off, I think at the top of the list is LaMelo. But before I, I go on that, I just want to add to what you were saying about uh, PJ uh, there, Richie, which is that like, I even think like, um, a, some of like the five out wide actions, which is something we've seen Golden State use in the playoffs this season, right? Where it looks like they're going to run a five out delay, but instead of throwing it to the center in the middle of the court, they're having, they're keeping the ball in the slot and they're having the center in the middle of the floor set an off ball screen. Usually the Warriors are doing this for Steph, right? And so he's catching, curling above the arc 
catching it. He can turn the corner and get downhill or he can look for his jump shot. And look, like a lot of teams run that stuff. Charlotte would run this with LaMelo. Boston runs it with Jason Tatum frequently. But I think that is like a really a great way to unlock both PJ and LaMelo together in these sort of like spread actions because LaMelo can curl, PJ can pop, and you can really put two off ball defenders in a bit of a bind or Rosier as the guy coming off the screen or James Booknight, you know, if he's getting into the mix more or finding ways to involve Miles Bridges as a guy you're trying to get downhill and PJ Washington. And maybe that's a switch with a lot of teams on the next level. But if you're going small with PJ at the five, well, then maybe you're throwing some different looks at people. And even if they do switch, those are two guys that can, that can attack a switch. Just going through some of the other like data database stuff I had, like the Nets ran like a design sort of like post up action after timeouts where they would throw it to like Jared Dudley or someone else on the block, then run an off ball back screen and then have the guy who just set the back screen come off of like a, like a wiper screen or like a down screen, like coming towards the basketball. It's a little like post split screen to screen interaction, which is something that Charlotte did a lot back third of this season. But that's something you can absolutely see with, uh, with bridges as the guy in the post, that's going to catch and face up and facilitate or PJ for that matter too. So that's another way to get the ball in PJ's hands in a way that is not just a pick and pop three or a spot up three or whatever. But I think the big thing is someone like LaMelo uh, would be at the top of my list. Seeing what happened in Brooklyn for Spencer mentioned uh, Dinwiddie earlier, but Karis LeVert, D'Angelo Russell. I mean, Russell was like, you can, we can pick at his all-star selection. I think that was what, 2019. I mean, he got red hot shooting floaters that season, but his development, you can even see it now with like what Russell has become for Minnesota, like an organizer of offense for, for this young Timberwolves team. So, yeah, my thought would be it has the top of the list has to be the development um, and really specifically the pick and roll on offense with Lamelo. Can he become more patient? Can he become uh, more like not trying to like take the top off the defense on every single play? Can he get uh, can he look to hit a hit a single or hit a double? Um, so, again, I think just making simplifying the pick and roll, making him more patient making him more versatile in those looks. And then, and then hopefully that also coinciding with LaMelo getting stronger, getting a little more explosive physically. So all of a sudden he becomes a more dangerous, you know, a, more of a predator getting downhill and getting all the way to the rim. So I would say at the top, it, it, it's someone like, I know, you know, LaMelo is already this team's best player, right? He's the most important player, but my thought would be, he would still be at the top of the list for guys that would benefit from, the advent of someone like uh, like Kenny Atkinson coming in here. Busby was good. I just wanted to say, hope everybody's having a good uh, Saturday morning so far. Um, I know I'm always back and forth between spaces, and I and I I'll, I'll be honest from from my perspective, I I wasn't too too impressed or happy about the hire. Pretty much everything y'all were saying earlier in the in the space where you were like just bad business as far as like giving an extension to Borrego, letting him go and then getting a dude that's pretty much the same guy. Only he'll be on TV digging in his nose and his ears, wiping boogers in his hair. I just, and, 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 I, and I'm going to make this real quick cause I want everybody else to get a chance to speak, but just to chime in on what you were saying, like we know who the best player on this team is, even though he still has a little ways to go as far as development goes, but we know that LaMelo is the best player on this team. And in my opinion, there was only one coach that was going to take this team to the level that I think that they could go. I understand the whole defensive struggles, and I get all that. But uh, we were in the space last night just talking about um, – and, and, of course, I'm talking about Dan Tony, if you didn't know. But we were talking about, um, you know, we, we, we know that the Dan Tony offense is always crazy and they're high-flying and high-scoring and everything, but it might not pan out in the playoffs. But – we had a guy last night who was like, you know, that D'Antoni defense that the Rockets was playing pushed what go, that Golden State team with KD to like six, seven, six games. I can't remember if it was six or seven games. And the only reason that they didn't win was because I think that was the year Chris Paul got hurt. And so obviously Harden flailed out like he always does. But they were holding their own against Golden State with KD and that was a Dan Tony ran team. I don't think that it would have been 
the same level, obviously, because there was a lot of talent on that Rockets team. But I think that when you have a star player who has all of the capabilities that blend perfectly with a head coach who, I, again, I guess it, for me it just goes back to I don't know how you don't cater to your, your star player. I don't, I don't see or hear these same things when it comes to a Luka or when it comes to a Trey, when it comes to now Jaws probably going to get all the favor that he wants. And when you have these young players that have all these these uh, these promising accolades, and for a dude that's 20 years old that was the youngest all-star, one of the youngest all-stars in league history, definitely the youngest all-star that we've ever had, and one of the only few that we've ever had, and being able to, to put Charlotte... How many times have you seen this damn LaMelo commercial of him eating cereal on TV now? Like, we are a national recognized thing because of this dude coming here, which I love for the for the longest because I wanted that. I wanted the 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 Hornets and this organization to thrive. And for me, I knew it wasn't gonna happen until we drafted somebody because nobody was going to come here in free agency. So I'm hoping that this decision I'm I'm really hoping that I'm wrong. That's what I'm getting at. I'm hoping that I'm wrong about Atkinson. I'm hoping that I'm wrong about this hiring because I want to see this team thrive. And I want to see us continue to go up the ladder of being relevant and being closer to being a championship caliber team rather than regressing and becoming the Hornets of old that have no TV games, have no, nobody talks about us, nobody's worried about us. And eventually we become another team that doesn't have any stars or have anybody want to come here. Thank y'all for the time. Always buzz beat. Um, shout out to everybody in here. And again, Hopefully everybody has a great Saturday, man. Thank you all, boys. Appreciate it. You know, the Atkinson LaMelo conversation, um, one thing we can all definitely agree on is that, you know, the Hornets are only going as far as, as LaMelo ball takes them. So, you know, and of course, Mitch Kupchak and Michael Jordan in the front office knows that. So, you know, they, they think that the things that Kenny Atkinson is going to bring are, are what LaMelo ball needs. Um, so we can we can dig in and debate what those things are exactly. Um, but I, I think we can at least rest whether you agree with this hire or you don't. You can rest easy knowing that the decision makers made this decision, understanding this is what LaMelo Ball, this is what was going to benefit him the most in, in his development as a professional basketball player and, and, and possibly as a human. Right. Like it. If, if there was that, that's maybe I'm reading too much into this, but when I hear we needed a new, a new voice and you got guys like Miles Bridges and young players, LaMelo Ball, these guys are, they're developing as humans too, not just basketball players. So there might have been um, a real fear that there's a lack of maturity here and we need a voice uh, that it maybe is a little bit more established. Maybe it is a little bit more willing to stick his chest out uh, in here to help these guys because we want to keep this core together. Um, that's that's somewhere where my mind goes when I think about this hire, just taking basketball out of it and trying to figure out how to make these guys understand what's actually going to make them a real winning product. They're all talented, yeah. right? Like, yeah. But so anyways, I just kind of wanted to build on that. Yeah, it does sort of like, I don't know, there's like probably, it's probably not worth fully digging in on this because it's three guys that like aren't, I mean, Richie, you did an excellent job the last couple of years being on the beat with this team as much as you could from from Zoom calls and stuff like that. But without being in the locker room, it's impossible to sort of know kind of like what the mentality of the team is on a day to day basis. The leadership aspect, like you only get what the team is putting out there. You know what I mean? Or like what you can try to like infer and read from watching all 82 games or whatever. But just you know, when Bismack Biombo was here, it was talked about like he was this incredible team leader. And look, maybe they, to an extent, maybe they missed him some this year, this season. It's just like a veteran, a uh, veteran presence because like the only like real vets on this roster the last couple of years have been, you know, been Gordon Hayward, Terry Rozier. It, it's it's a little like it's a little unfortunate that some of the before Charlotte hit the reset button, some of the vets they had were some of like the best leaders in basketball, Marvin Williams, Kemba Walker, like, like really like just awesome guys. And like, yeah, that brought, were incredibly talented players, especially someone like Kemba, like all the skill in the world and that guy. But 
brought the intangibles on a night to night basis too. And it's like, you know, so I'll be curious to see how they, how the coaching staff rounds out under Atkinson, maybe how the roster rounds out um, as well. Like, or is there some thoughts to try to like, um, as you're trying to like rebuild and I'm not saying like um, sign a vet to sign a vet or anything like that, but just like, is there any sort of like thought about, well, how can we round out this roster and do so in a way that's maybe going to uh, sort of like into like having people in the locker room that are going to reaffirm the voice, right. That's coming from the head coach. That's maybe another way to do it. But like, if they want to go that route, it's, it's a little tough because they've just drafted so many young guys the last couple of years and they've got three more picks in the top 45 of the draft this year. So, you know, how do you strike a balance with that? That'll be a little interesting. Uh, real quickly, I, we talked about this. At the, um, this is a bit of a, a, a non sequitur, so forgive me. But I did want to provide a little bit of of added context here. We talked about Atkinson and uh, the defensive scheme uh, that he ran with uh, the Nets at the start of the podcast. Uh, I've pulled up the cleaning the glass defensive shot numbers here. Year one under Atkinson, 2016-2017, Brooklyn's defense – uh, 13th in the NBA in terms of opponent percentage of shots at the rim, uh, 35%. Uh, that dropped down to 33% the following year. That was a top eight number in the NBA. Back up to 35% in 2018, 2019. That was still a top 10 number in the NBA. And then Atkinson's last season, obviously he wasn't a full coach in 2019 and 2020. That was the, the bubble season and also when, when Jacques Vaughn took over right just really right before the shutdown, but Brooklyn number two in the NBA percentage of opponent shots at the rim, 31%. And also in that 17, 18 season, which Brooklyn was not very good that year. Um, and they were really just kind of like trying stuff out and, and it was sort of like extreme Maury ball on offense. And uh, defensively that year though, they did their defense was number one in the NBA the percentage of opponent shots that were corner threes, 5.2% and non corner threes, 20%. So unsurprisingly opponents, only 25.3% of their shots that season that year against Brooklyn were uh, of the three point variety. So they've really forced teams into a lot of mid range shots that year, over 41% of opponent uh, field goal attempts that year. Uh, were were like yeah uh, from the mid range so some kind of encouraging numbers in that but obviously a lot's going to depend on yeah the pers- the personnel Charlotte brings to the dance next season and in the following year and and how Kenny Atkinson adapts his scheme towards that towards that personnel yeah I think if they get a drop style center I think Atkinson is going to try to go for that defensive scheme Brian but uh, we do appreciate the question and and the valid concern from Belk here in Twitter spaces I think there are concerns with Atkinson just like there would be with D'Antoni you know his age his offensive focus style I think with the need for a new voice in the locker room I, I think this hiring mostly accomplishes that but you know with his only other Head coaching job, as Spencer alluded to at the top of this thing, the way that it did end, you have to wonder if LaMelo continues to develop the way that he should and can, is there going to be a moment where he wants a bigger role? Not saying that this will happen, but it's something that's also crossed my mind just because of the way that his tenure ended in Brooklyn. So we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks to all those that joined on Twitter spaces. If you join late, it'll be out as a podcast a little bit later today. For Spencer, for Brian, I'm Richie. Have a good Saturday. Mama is treating me to breakfast. Yep, let me see your phone. Huh? Look here. I download this McDonald's app because when you buy any bagel sandwich like the steak, egg, and cheese bagel, you get one free. Wait, you just bought that on my phone. That's right. Now that you got McDonald's money, you could treat Mama. (laughs) Okay, Ma, you got it. Valid for product of equal or lesser value. Valid through 10 22 at participating McDonald's. Valid one time per day. App download and registration required. Mm-hmm.